and uh, thank you all for joining. Vanessa, hello to you. Uh, we Good start. evening, Pastor. Good, Good evening, everyone. Good evening. We've all wished each other. Um, I just, I, I sometimes, I'm not sure if uh, some of you receive uh, our notifications, especially when I put up uh, Bible study topics. Uh, I just wanted to uh, let you see the Bible study topic for today. Uh, and here it is. I'm showing it on the screen. <laughs> uh, I'll explain a little bit more of that as we go along. Does membership in a denomination or a church make one a Christian? And I want to uh, go further and talk about what criteria should one employ before attending a church. So uh, I just wanted to uh, make sure that we are all on the same page. But before we begin, let us uh, let me ask for God's presence with us. Join me as I pray. Loving, gracious Father, once again, uh, we thank you that uh, you give us this uh, opportunity to be uh, together, to discuss, to learn. Uh, it's uh, what a privilege it is, Father, to, to have your scriptures and to know your scriptures. But as always, we need to grow in uh, that knowledge. And we just thank you so much that uh, your Holy Spirit continues to lead us, as Jesus said, lead us into all truth, even though we don't have it all at this moment, in all its fullness, but we look forward to the time when uh, your knowledge will cover the earth as the seas cover the, uh, the waters cover the sea. So thank you, Father. Ask for your uh, guidance as we talk and discuss and uh, pray that your blessings be upon each one of us as we attend. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, what prompted me to do this study was... Uh, a question that was asked to me after I had given a sermon not uh, not long back. Uh, I was talking about um, a, a, a topic in which I used an example of an individual who belongs to a particular denomination. And I'm going to try my best not to name any denominations so that we can keep it, uh, you know, safe. Uh, since it's on social media. Uh, but the example I used was that this particular person uh, was uh, went through a harrowing time. He was abducted uh, by, you know, the ISIS group. Uh, this was in the Middle East. And uh, he had to, I mean, he saw these people killing uh, others, who belong to the organization and but thankfully his life was spared but he had a harrowing time uh, being under captivity and he was in captivity for uh, 557 days as uh, as the report goes and the interesting thing and what i wanted to highlight was that while in captivity he kept praying, obviously, being a religious man. Uh, he kept praying and asking, certainly for God's uh, deliverance. But also, he prayed for his captors, those who kept him under captivity. Uh, he also prayed, specifically asking that God would forgive them for what they are doing. And of course, what they were doing was horrendous. And so um, I use that example to show how the Holy Spirit can work in the lives of uh, ordinary people, um, no matter where one comes from, the Holy Spirit has the ability to work with people, uh, especially in difficult times, especially when you're reaching out to God, asking for his help. And, uh, you know, asking for his guidance and, and even going further above and beyond and asking that God will forgive those uh, who were putting him under so much of uh, suffering. 
Now, after I had finished my sermon, I had this uh, individual come to me and ask me this question. And the question was, how could you say that the Holy Spirit works with this person because this person belongs to a particular denomination which, according to some, are not Christian, right? Uh, he belonged to a denomination that was, you know, uh, supposedly uh, a, a cult, you could say, or uh, have heretical teachings, uh, do not have... Um, all of the teachings that, uh, you know, that we believe is core essentials of Christianity. And so the question was, um, can the Holy Spirit work with those who belong to a, a denomination that might not have all the correct teachings of uh, the Bible? So the I, of course, I, I went on to explain a few things, and that's what I want to do here today. Uh, it, when, when a question like that is asked, the assumption is that if you belong to a particular denomination that is suspect, that, 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 has, that has heretical teachings, the assumption is that you're automatically disqualified as a Christian. People will not recognize you as a Christian, right? A disciple of Jesus. Right. And of course, there are those who believe that you can be a Christian only if you belong to uh, a, you know, a, uh, a an institution, which according to them is the true church. And of course, when I say the true church, we had that uh, teaching at one time because we innocently believed that we were the only true church, just like so many other organizations or institutions believe they are the true church. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, so the question was, are you a Christian because you belong to a particular church? Or is the criteria for being a Christian something else? And that is what I want to bring up today. And additionally, along with what I would like to discuss uh, with, with this particular point, is also to uh, ask the question, sh if you're a Christian, should you belong to a church? Right? And I want to end with then discussing, should we avoid some churches? Especially those churches that we tend to believe have quite a bit of heretical teachings, teachings that are not biblical. So these are some of the questions that I am raising and hopefully we'll uh, uh, try to go over them and uh, keep thinking about them. Maybe you have some thoughts that you would like to share. Now, as we talk about church, as we talk about being a Christian, let's look at some basic facts. The basic facts are, Jesus said, I will build my church. You know, that's uh, recorded in, um, by uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. He says, I will build my church. And you remember, he also, he goes on to say, the gates of hell will never prevail against it. But notice he said, I will build my church. Uh, what we have to understand there is the church is a concept that Jesus Christ introduced. It is not we, human beings, introduced the concept of church. The whole idea of church is originator, the originator of church is Jesus Christ. And he also said that he will build his church. So he has to be building a church. <laughs> the question is, what is this church? And we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, so for Jesus Christ, we can conclude that the church is very important. All right. Now, secondly, another very important fact is that he loves the church. Right. And if you you will probably remember in Ephesians chapter five, while he talks about husbands and wives and their duties and how they not need to relate, he says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He doesn't stop there. What else does he say? And he gave himself up for her, gave himself to the church. Right. And of course, we know through his sacrificial uh, death on the cross, he was giving himself to the church. 
But an important fact is Christ loves the church. He is the builder of the church. He is the originator of the concept of church. He is also, he also loves the church. Right? If and if we, as disciples of Jesus, who believe in Jesus, if we have the mind of Christ, if we trust Jesus uh, in what he has said about the church, we too must. I mean, for us also, church must be important. For us also, that we must also love the church. We must also give ourselves to the church, right? In service, in uh, loving it, right? So uh, these, these basic facts are very important. Um, sadly, there are some who <laughs> hate the church. <laughs> Uh, and uh, rightly so, I suppose, in some si situations, some, inst some institutions are so rotten, so abusive, and yeah, I, I can understand. I mean, that is uh, thinking that the church is an institution. That's where the problem is. But, um, but uh, let's keep those basic facts in mind. Let's move then to also understand, and this is something that's familiar to you, the Greek word for uh, you know, the Greek word used for church is ekklesia. Ekklesia meaning um, an assembly. Uh, we used to say the called out ones, right? The called out ones. Uh, it's a communion of people. Now, here is where I want to begin to answer the questions that I had posed. The first question being, what is it that we must regard with? Uh, how should we look at the church? What is this church? Right. And here, what is important for us to understand is that church refers to people. It certainly doesn't refer to buildings. <laughs> Je Jesus Christ didn't say, I will build, you know, a cathedral or a, uh, you know, whatever, uh, a building. No, he's building a church. He's building people. He's investing in people. He's not investing in real estate. He's investing in people. So the church refers to a to a church uh, to a, a people, not buildings. And who are these people? Obviously, it is people who have faith in Jesus Christ. He is building up this, these people who are growing in faith, who have entrusted their lives to Jesus, who have come to believe in Jesus that uh, as their personal savior and have become disciples of him. Their faith is in Jesus. Their faith is not in an institution. Get the difference. Their faith is in Jesus Christ, not in an institution. Right? Faith in an institution does not make you a Christian. Faith in Jesus makes you and me a Christian. Right? So, when the question was asked to me, how can you say the Holy Spirit works with this individual because he belongs to a particular denomination and that denomination does not have biblical teachings? Can that person be a Christian even though he belongs to an institution that have her heretical teachings? So that's the question I want to ask all of us. And redefine for ourselves what is church church is not an institution certainly not a building it is it, it it is people right so the denomination or the church that you belong to does not make you a christian right what makes you and me a christian is faith in jesus christ our belief in jesus christ you may leave an institution you may leave a, a particular church. For example, you know, there are those who move from one location to another location and they find another church. Now, have they, have they stopped being a Christian because they left the old church? No, they still remain a Christian. So the church does not make you a Christian. It is your belief in Jesus, wherever you are. Whichever church you belong, if you believe in Jesus, that is what makes you a Christian. Right? 
Also, you cannot say that a person is not a Christian just because he belongs to, like I said, a particular denomination that is considered a cult or whatever. Right? That does not dismiss his Christianity just because he belongs to a particular denomination. Okay? So, just to drive the point home, let me just share my screen and just show you some pictures. <laughs> All right. All right. Just give me a moment. All right. Just to... Uh... Okay. Here we are. Can you see that uh, uh, beautiful church building there? I don't know which one it is. Somewhere in Europe, probably. <laughs> that is That is a building. That is a building with a lot of good architecture, but that's not a church. <laughs> Technically speaking, that's not a church. Even though we call it a church, I mean, because we understand what we are trying to, uh, we, you know, when we refer in our parlance, but technically speaking, spiritually speaking, that's not a church. Do you see the second picture? Uh, let me just see if I can move this forward. You see the... Um, oh, why I can't move this down? Uh, the second picture, uh, in a nutshell, you see all the denominations, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, Anglican, Coptic, Pentecostal, Catholic, Orthodox. You see that, right? Uh, those are not churches. <laughs> right? They're institutions. They're denominations. Right? So, that is not a church. What is a church? This is a church. Can you see the faces of people now? Of course, you won't recognize any one of them. I just picked it out of the net. But that is a church. It's the people who are who are the church, right? It is not a building. It's not a. It's uh, yeah. in other words, you and I are the church, right? And what makes us a church and what makes us a Christian? <coughs> belief in Jesus, not belief in an institution. Okay. All right. I'll just stop sharing there. So I just wanted to bring up, uh, you know, make it a little bit more visual for you and me. Now, once we yeah. understand that, that it is our faith in Jesus, no matter which institution we might belong to, that is what makes us a Christian. Uh, now, we may be a faulty Christian. We may be wanting as a Christian because some of our beliefs are not according to the scriptures or we, we may have extra biblical beliefs. Now, those, I'm not discussing that, but what fundamentally makes us a Christian is belief in Jesus. And that's very important. Not belief in an institution. Okay. Now, the church, you and I are the church. When we all come together, we form the church. We are the assembly. We are the ecclesia. But the church exists at different levels. Now, the church can exist or a, at a universal level. All Christians. And who are Christians? Those who believe in Jesus. All of them can be considered to be the universal church, the church as a uh, as a whole. If I can use the word, we are the worldwide church. <laughs> Our name very familiar to us, right? Right. Um, so, on a universal level, all of us form the church. Now, there are at a local level. There is a church at a local level. Who are they? In Hyderabad, we meet together uh, here and we form the church. There are other groups like last Sunday, I preached in a Methodist church. Uh, they asked me to uh, preach for Father's Day. And I preached in a gathering of people who form the church. But they are a Methodist denomination. We are GCI denominations. So, uh, you know, so at the local level, there is a church. Then... At a denominational level, a group of group of people coming together can form a denomination, right? For example, the Baptists believing in Calvinism will form a denomination, right? Or the mode of baptism they use, they will say we are uh, we have a common practice of how we do baptism, so we we become a denomination. The Seventh Day Adventists 
have become a denomination because they believe that the seventh day Sabbath is what distinguishes them from all others. Anglicans on a shared history, they become a denomination, right? So there is a church that exists at the universal level, the local level, and the denominational level, just to bring in some of those uh, distinctions so that we understand what we're talking about, all right? Now, once again, let me reiterate. The, the, the universal level or the, or the local congregation or the denomination, none of them make you a Christian. You may belong to any one of those, but none of them make you a Christian. What makes you and me a Christian is Jesus Christ. Okay? The church may be a registered institution. Let's say here in India, we are registered under the Society's Registration Act. That gives us a legal entity. We are a group of people registered under the Society Registration Act. It gives us a legal entity. Right? But the registered institution is not the church. It is the people. It's the people. We only have a legal entity because of the registration. Right? So, finally coming down to answering the question that this that was posed to me by this individual, and I'm not sure if he understood what I said. I tried to explain all of this, of course, in a nutshell. What I told him was, the church is the body of Christ. It's a spiritual entity. It's a spiritual organism. It's a spiritual reality. It ha it it it, it the, the it it is uh, it is not an institution. With, with buildings and all of those things. No. It is a spiritual reality. And I want to just go through a few scriptures. I'll put them on the screen so that you can uh, read it with me. Uh, give me just a moment as I do that. Uh, look at some of these scriptures, which uh, hopefully will give you uh, a better understanding of what I am trying to talk about. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 27. It says, now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. So individually, when we believe in Jesus, we become Christ's body. We join Christ's body. And what is Christ's body? It is the church. It is not a building. It's not an institution. It's a spiritual reality, and that is Christ's body. Look at Romans, the second scripture on your screen. Romans 12, verses 4 to four and 5. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, we, those who believe in Jesus, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. In other words, we belong to one another. Because we individually who repose our faith in Jesus have become part of Christ's body. So collectively, we are the body of Christ. Individually, we are members and we belong to one another. One more scripture and that is 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12 and verse 13 on the, the last one on your screen. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, it says, For by one spirit... We were all baptized into one body. Notice, we were baptized into one. Which body is this? The body of Christ. We were not baptized into, into the Catholic Church or the Methodist Church or the Baptist Church. We were not baptized into Grace Communion International or Worldwide Church of God. We were baptized into the body of Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why every time I have baptized people, I, I, I make it a point to say I'm not baptizing you into a into the uh, 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 physical institution. I'm baptizing you into the body of Jesus Christ. It's a spiritual body. And then it goes on to say the scripture, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Now, when we believe in Jesus, God, Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit. And because of that spirit, we become one body. And hence, the body of Jesus Christ is the church, right? And we are members of it because we believe 
in Jesus Christ. All right. So, just to then uh, cap up, you know, and bring a clarification in my sermon. When I use an example of an individual who may belong to Catholic Church, Methodist Church, Anglican Church, whichever church, when I use the example of an individual, I am using him as a person who believes in Jesus. Not necessarily that he belongs to an institution, right? That institution may have all the faults, but I cannot fault that individual for his belief in Jesus, right? And when I use an example of an individual who may belong to whatever organization or institution, I'm not saying I agree with that institution and all its teachings. I do not agree with some of the teachings of many of these institutions. There are churches that I completely reject and I will never, I will never want to ever be part of that. But I cannot deny that one person who believes in Jesus is not a Christian. I cannot deny that. I cannot judge him according, accordingly. So when I use the example of an individual who may belong to whatever institution, all I'm saying is that one individual person who believes in Christ is a genuine member of the body of Christ. He may belong to, you know, wherever, GCI, Baptist, Anglican, wherever, but he also what is more important is he belongs to the body of Jesus Christ. That is the spiritual organism. Okay. So, uh, unfortunately, the individual that spoke to me and had this question thought that I'm endorsing all the wrong teachings of the institution that he belongs to, which I'm not. And this is where I think people sometimes are too quick to judge. And they must take time to understand and give benefit of doubt and ask the question so that one can explain what I meant when I used that example. So if I can just uh, wrap up this and just move to the second point, it is wrong for me to judge a person as not being a Christian just because he belongs to some particular church that I don't agree with. I cannot judge that, right? It is Christ who judges. And so I just wanted to pass that on uh, to all of you. Now, my, my, uh, uh, quickly then, uh, I want to just cover two more points. If you are a Christian and you know who is a Christian, one who believes in Jesus, should you then belong to a church? Right? If you are a Christian, should you belong to a church? And the simple answer, the short answer is yes. Why? Because the clear teachings of scripture is that Christians who believe in Jesus meet together, they worship together, they serve together, they learn together, they eat together, they help one another. How can you be a Christian if all of these things are absent? And Jesus gave us the identifying sign of a true believer. And you remember John 13, right? How did he... Uh, I, how did he identify a true believer, a true Christian? He says, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And notice verse 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple. You belong to me. You believe in me. You are a Christian, in other words. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. So, should you belong to a fellowship? Should you belong to a communion of people? Yes, certainly. In fact, the most functional Christian is one that is in communion with one another. Recently, I was uh, talking to uh, one of our members, you know, uh, she had gone through a kidney transplant and she was explaining to me, you know, how uh, she uh, had to wait and then a kidney was made available and then the transplant was done. I was just thinking to myself, here is a kidney that was made available. Huh? That is a part of somebody's body, but it was severed and made available as for transplant, right? I thought to myself, that kidney is alive, right? It is alive. It is taken out of a person who probably had an accident or whatever, but the person 
was uh, was dead, but the kidney was alive because they harvested the kidney quickly. But that kidney will become functional only if it is attached to another body. If that kidney is left by itself, it loses its function. Similarly, a Christian who believes in Jesus will be most functional if he or she belongs to the body, the body of Jesus Christ. That is where we become most functional. Right? Uh, now, that does not mean to say, here is a clarification, that some are not able to attend church for various reasons. They are not able to be part of a body because of various reasons, you know, health reasons, isolation. They are not in a position or in a place where there is a, you know, a, a group of people they can meet. No, they, I am not, I am not under any circumstance judging anyone that probably have not yet found a fellowship. Right. But I think it is it needs to be said that a Christian uh, cannot remain isolated. He he or he and she or, or she must have or rather I should say becomes most functional. I'm not saying they stop being a Christian. No, he becomes most functional when they are part of a body. I'd like to just read very quickly Hebrews 10 and verse 19, uh, 19 onwards so that this becomes more clearer. Here the, here the uh, author says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, now see, that's the confidence we have because of the blood of Jesus. We have now become Christian. By a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings. So we have now drawn close to God because of our belief, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, right? Then notice what he says, and I'm dropping down to verse 23, Hebrews chapter 10. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. So we hang on to our faith because we trust that the person who has promised, that is Jesus Christ, is faithful. He will fulfill that promise. Then he goes on to say, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, we believe in Jesus, but that belief then, uh, you know, makes us to join and have communion with one another. We have communion with God, loving God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and we also love our neighbor as ourselves. So, so that becomes very important, right? I remember uh, uh, somebody saying, you know, uh, oh, I do Jesus, but I don't do church. And that is a contradiction. It's incompatible. You know, if you do Jesus, you will certainly do church. But uh, there are those who don't do church because they think that, you know, they are functional and they are not. Finally, one more last question. Are there churches that you must avoid? <laughs> and the short answer is yes. Now, let me explain. There is no perfect church in the world, right? I mean, when I say church, a group of people or, in, or beliefs or institution, whatever. There is no perfect church in the world. So, it is wrong for us not to attend just because the church is imperfect. But, there are some things that I think are, are, are very important. And those of us who are church goers and believe in a communion and, and, and community of people who are believers of Jesus Christ, there, there are some core beliefs that a church must teach. Now, if the church denies these core doctrines, then I think I would, I would not be comfortable in going to that church. If they deny or they teach against these core doctrines, then I feel that that church is 
suspect. In other words, I, I wouldn't want to go there because then they are not holding to the faith that was once delivered. What are the core doctrines? And now, of course, uh, uh, we can pick and choose, I guess, but I am going to give you the definition that is given by the National Association of Evangelicals in the U.S. GCI is a member of the National Association of Evangelicals. We became a member because we hold to these core doctrines. We also believe in the core doctrines. Very quickly, the core doctrines are, number one, the Trinity. There is one God in three persons, with each person possessing all the attributes of deity and personality. That is a core doctrine. Second, the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the unique God-man possessing full humanity with undiminished deity. Number three, the second coming. Jesus will one day personally return to the earth to rule and judge. Number four, salvation. Man is saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And number five, the scripture. The Bible is the inherent word of God and therefore sufficient for all of Christian life. Those are the five doctrines that the National Evangelical Association uh, believe in, and we are members of them because we hold to those core doctrines. All right? I'll leave it there. Um, so, attending a church, I want to make sure that the church teaches these core doctrines. They may teach other things, which I may not or may not fully endorse. But if they don't teach these, then I don't belong to that church. Secondly, why, what is another church that you must avoid? Churches that are cults, cultic. What are cultic churches? Once again, uh, you know, <laughs> we can take a whole Bible study on that. But I'll just very quickly say, what are cult church, cultic churches or churches that are considered cults? Churches that are controlling, abusive, devotion to a man instead of Jesus Christ. They employ psychological manipulation. They employ threats. They are they have a dictatorship without accountability, and they have no tolerance for criticism. This is what defines a cult. So we must follow Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said, Follow me, and he didn't stop there. He said, Follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. Follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. We must follow those who follow Christ, not their own imaginations. All right? I leave it there now. Thank you very much. I hope you uh, had a lot of food for thought. Uh, what time is it now? Well, we got a good 20 minutes. So uh, please come up with any comments, questions, thoughts. Yes, sir. Anil, go ahead. <laughs> When you say universal church, what exactly does it mean? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a collection of all the members who believe in Jesus all over the world. Hmm. So that is why I think in the early, uh, I don't know if it was used in the Nicene Creed, but uh, uh, maybe it was used in the Nicene Creed. Uh, where they say that we believe in one Catholic church. You know the word Catholic is actually universal, universal right? Yeah. In other words, what uh, what the universal church is a, the a sum of all the all the believers, sum of all the believers, not denominations, the sum of all believers, because there could be some denominations that uh, have members that are not, uh, you know, Christian. Right. How can that be? How can they be a member of a denomination where they're not Christians? Um, <laughs> once again, I, I can't judge. Uh, they, 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 you know, there they, they may be people who join a church just because of the benefits that it gives you. I know in India, people get baptized by for for money. You know, uh, they they become they are called rice Christians. Uh, yeah. because, <laughs> <laughs> they are they are given various kinds of benefits, you know, educational institute. They they don't believe in Jesus. That they, I mean, there are Hindus who take in baptism but remain Hindus. 
uh, because they want to get the benefits, right? So uh, in, in that respect, I, I don't know. I, once again, I am not the one to judge. But those people, uh, I don't think, uh, have any belief in Jesus. And if they don't have uh, faith in Jesus, they're not Christian. Though they belong to an institution. <laughs> Frankly, I think you have a question. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. So can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. <laughs> sir, uh, if, if, I, if I catch you properly, uh, you made a statement, sir. The universal church is not the church. Am I correct? Uh, uh, no, what I meant was by belonging to a institution, you are not a, you don't become a Christian. Yes. Right. Yeah. I, I, I probably uh, didn't use that word uh, universal correctly. Okay. What I meant was if you just because you belong to an institutional church, you don't become a Christian. You become a Christian only because you believe in Jesus. You want to follow up on that, Francis? Sir, sir, the, the, the universe is the universal church an institution or is it a body of believers? Well, I mean, uh, uh, you know, you can say, you know, Catholic church. Catholic means universal. Now, Catholic church also also is a denomination, right? Now, just because you belong to a denomination doesn't make you a Christian. Right? Uh, so. Uh, universal church, I mean to say, at that particular level, is a collection of all the, a uh, sum total of all the believers. Believers. Okay. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, sir, I have one more question. Go ahead. But, um, may I give the opportunity for other members to participate? And I will pose this as a last question. Well, I mean, uh, if, you, if you want to wait, you are welcome. But you are, you know, uh, we can take no, your question no, sir, right now. We can take your question right now, but looks like you are frozen, uh, Frank. Uh, <laughs> can you I hear us? I would like to be gracious and give other members to raise their question. Okay, let's honor your grace and let's go to Bertram. <laughs> Bertram, go ahead. <laughs> can you hear me, Mr. Zakara? Bertie, we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, I would like uh, Franklin to be more gracious when he said, uh, uh, if I have rightly... Uh, if I've uh, caught you or catch you or something you mentioned, and then I think you should use the word if I correctly heard you. Uh, uh, <laughs> please pardon me. <laughs> That's just pardon. colloquial, colloquial English. Hello, just uh, just joking, just joking. Yeah. Um, you had a question, buddy? Uh, no, uh, not really a question. But I was just wondering in this pre-baptismal uh, counseling. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, when a person is uh, about to be baptized, I I don't know, Mr. Zakara, whether we had pre-baptismal counseling by Mr. Hunting or Mr. Frankel. I don't remember that, but uh, nevertheless, we were baptized. And but uh, in this pre-baptismal counseling, do they uh, teach? Do they mention about these core beliefs that we uh, that person is uh, uh, should be knowing or following or supposed to be aware of and to follow it? Do they mention the core beliefs? Well, whether whether they mention or not, I'm not sure, but they must. <laughs> <laughs> they must make sure that the person who is going to be baptized uh, believe in these core uh, essentials. Yes. Right. Franklin, you can pose your question if you'd like. Okay, sir. Okay. Sir, uh, uh, before I begin, sir, uh, can you tell me, sir, who are the Presbyter Presbyterians? Presbyterian. Oh, okay. They are a denomination on, a, on their own. Um, I, I'm not very familiar with them, but um, uh, they have a form of governance which, which, uh, where the leaders are called presbyters, right? And uh, also, they are I think reformed. They are when you say reformed, they are more uh, Calvinistic, right? Uh, they they subscribe to some of Calvinism and his teaching, Calvin and his teachings. So, uh, but I, I I must confess that I am not fully aware exactly what their uh, you know uh, 
what do you call it, their core beliefs could be. I am presuming that their core beliefs are in an in. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. So for my personal, form. I wanted to know for my personal knowledge. Right. Now, sir, now coming to the uh, what I wanted to say, sir, uh, the National Evangelistic, uh, is it called Association, sir? A National Association of Evangelists. Uh, yeah. I think they did a fantastic job, sir. Hats off to them. Mm -hmm. in, in so far as they clearly spelt out uh, point by point in black um, what the core beliefs of Christianity is. Would you agree with me, sir? Yes, in fact, that is the reason why we are members of uh, uh, yes. NAE, -N -A -E, as it is called, National Association of Evangelicals. Yes. So we are considered to be uh, the uh, you know, evangelicals. Now, I'm presuming that a lot of Baptist churches are, but Baptists have their own denomination called SBC, Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, and I'm presuming they are also members of uh, NAE. Uh, NA Yes, yes, sir. So very good, sir. That uh, um, no, sir. Actually, sir, uh, if you uh, uh, the point was, sir, what are the core beliefs? Suppose a, a question is posed, what are the what is the uh, sir, in one word or in one sentence? Please give me what is the core belief of Christianity. Uh, my answer would be, sir, it is Christ centric, uh, both in words and in deeds. But the National Evangelistic Association of Churches have clearly spelt out. Step by step. Yeah. yeah, see what when you believe in Jesus, these must automatically follow. For if you believe yes, in Jesus, exactly. yes. uh, you know, you, you have to believe that God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, okay. right? Okay. And that He uh, it is in Him we have salvation, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. And Him alone. Okay. He so, automatically well, believes you automatically will believe that He inspired the scriptures. And we understand about Christianity from the scriptures. All right. Uh, and the fact that he's going to come again, that is our hope. So if you believe in Jesus, this has to follow. You cannot, uh, you know, negate any one of them and then still believe in Jesus. Sir, in, in, in 1999, no, sir, uh, a statement was issued, sir. A statement of inerrancy of scriptures was signed by more than uh, more than sir about uh, uh, three or uh, two hundred denominations. Sir. Yes. Uh, uh, sometime back, I remember, has GCI India signed uh, signed this inerrancy of uh, statement, inerrancy of scripture statement? You're talking about 1899, sir. 1999, sir. Oh, uh, 1999. After, 1999, after an, after an exhaustive study of over uh, about a decade, yeah. uh, a number of churches have drawn up a clear, uh, like this uh, national evangelistic, they have uh, about the inerrancy of scriptures. Okay. Now, I want to study the subject of inerrancy of scriptures, sir. Yes. yes. Uh, so, my question is, sir, is GCI a member? Has GCI signed the uh, statement of inerrancy of scriptures? Uh, I am not aware of actually physically signing the document, but I can only say that we do believe in the inerrancy of scripture. Yes. The inspiration no, sir, no, and... No, the problem is, no, sir, with the, uh, with the Christian dem is, yeah. uh, sir, when you talk about inerrancy of scriptures, what I mean is, sir, it is refers to the totality of scriptures from yeah. Genesis to Revelation. Correct. It includes uh, inerrancy in, in history. It includes inerrancy in poetry. It includes inerrancy in, in science. Now, the mainstream Christianity, sir, don't accept uh, science, sir. Uh, yes. This is what exactly, sir, uh, one of, uh, I was discussing with Pastor Praveen, and if I remember, if I recall correctly, he said, no, the word inerrancy refers only to salvation. He's limiting the, uh, the meaning and the scope of inerrancy of scripture, sir. I disagree with him. Okay. <laughs> so I, I refer, sir, it means science. It includes creation accounts. It includes the flood accounts. Uh, it includes the everything. So what is your take, sir? What is your take? I, uh, what I feel is that uh, it is semantics. Uh, we I think we are basically uh, agreed on what it means, but we are using words that probably don't uh, gel with one another. You know, for example, we do not use the word infallibility of the Bible, right? Infallible. Now, because that gives a wrong meaning. Uh, it means that there are no grammatical errors. There are no spelling errors. Uh, you know, when you translate the scriptures from the manuscripts, 
there could be some mistakes made and there are mistakes. So uh, infallibility we don't use, but inerrancy is something that uh, we subscribe to because it is a document that we can trust. It is something that we have, we can repose our faith in. That is what it means. And I don't think any one of us will disagree with that. We believe that the scripture is uh, inspired of God and gives us an accurate understanding of the Christian life. So that is what it means. And that's what we believe. Now, when you say science, now, once again, we have to qualify. Now, is the Bible against science? No, obviously not. But is the, is the Bible a science textbook? Should it be read as like a science textbook? No, it was not meant to be because we did not have scientific vocabulary when the Bible was written. Scientific vocabulary was, is, has come now. So when the creation account was written, it was not written in scientific language. It was written in poetic language because the vocabulary did not exist at that time. So the Bible is not against science, but the Bible is not a science textbook. We have to make that distinction. Uh, sir, uh, I agree with you. The Bible is not a science textbook, but there are over two dozen chapters, sir, in the Bible that deals with science faith rela relationship. And uh, now, now, now coming to the uh, terminology, you know, sir. Now the the uh, the Old Testament uh, speaks about the law of decay, sir. Just few few minutes, sir. Yeah. The the Old Testament speaks about the law of decay, and yeah. Paul, writing in the book of Romans, also speaks about the law of or the law of decay. Our bodies are decaying, the cars decay, our houses decay, the whole universe decays. Now yeah. this is nothing, sir. In the scientific terminology, we call it the second law of thermodynamics. We call it the law of entropy. So there is perfect concurrence, sir. So my take is no, sir. My take is the science. The statements regarding science in the Bible are 100% accurate and inerrant. Would you agree, sir? So, uh, you have just proved my point. The Bible is not against science. The Bible will validate scientific uh, you know, laws and, and principles. But the law of entropy is not written in the Bible. <laughs> I mean, it's not written in the Bible in the sense it can be it can be, uh, what's the word? Um, um, it, it may allude to that, right? For example, uh, uh, you know, sin brings death. That is the law of entropy, <laughs> if I can say, you know. Uh, so uh, you, I, sometimes I think we, we fight over something which is not, <laughs> which, is, which does not necessarily, uh, you know, have to be that way. So I think we are agreed. Okay. Any thoughts? I think I'm, I'm not sure if somebody else was raising their <laughs> finger. Was it Bertram or uh, Mr. Rao? I'm not sure. Mm. Okay. But I just noticed Shanti has joined us. Hello, Shanti. Hope you're okay. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. I was meant to join early. I got caught up in something else and I missed a very good uh, study, I feel. There's a, a very uh, robust discussion going on. Yeah. I heard it all. Right. And yes. Um, Good. Yeah, I'm waiting. Thing. Yeah. Thank you. Anil, go ahead. Uh, you know, there is also something called uh, the uh, West Westminster Statement of Faith, or Westminster Doctrine, something like that. Right. Which I a uh, number of times from the listeners we hear on TV or on YouTube, they mention this often. Are you familiar with that? The Westminster Catechism or Westminster Statement of Faith, something like that. Right. Uh, once again, I must confess, I, I'm not fully knowledgeable about it, but what I can understand is it is mostly, it, it is from a Catholic, I'm going to say not Catholic, but uh, Anglican, Anglican, Anglican yeah. background. It is yeah. the Anglican Statement of Beliefs, I think, and they call it the Westminster, yeah. you know, Catechism or whatever. Uh, yeah. So, and I, and I, once again, I have not studied the documents, so I'm, I'm presuming that they have all the core doctrines. <laughs> right. They have much more, but they have the core doctrines. Okay. Uh, Bertie wanted to make a point, sir. Bertie wanted to make a point. Right. I was just uh, wanting uh, to mention about uh, this thing. 
the Christ, all that the Lord has done for us, the Lord Jesus Christ in his, um, in his humanity, um, is, uh, am I right, that all that he has done, that's why we say Christ is our life and our life supply. He is our life. Everything that is uh, done, like uh, we are justified because of Christ and we are sanctified, made holy. And that's important. And yeah. we're eventually we're glorified. God has promised, you know, having life uh, in Christ and given to us because of our faith in Christ. That is and, one of the core doctrines, Bertram. Yeah, yeah. As it says, man is saved by faith alone in Christ yeah. alone. Right. Uh, right. So our salvation is, uh, you know, a gift that God has given to us. Of course, we must receive it. That's right. It's a gift. It is not something we man man manufacture. And some churches don't teach it in that way. They say uh, you must have faith, but it must also have works. No, <laughs> now that that is that will open a can of worms. No. <laughs> uh, when you say, uh, will faith will will faith mean that you have no works? What we want to say, what the core doctrine is that you're saved by Christ, not your works. Works are important. Works must follow faith. But you are not saved by works. You're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. That is the core doctrine. Okay, well, I guess uh, <laughs> we have done uh, well today. Uh, I, I didn't expect that we would stay off the entire one hour, but thank you very much, all of you, for joining. And what a pleasure to, you know, once again continue to discuss and talk. And uh, it, it's really invigorating to have uh, these discussions. So let's end uh, today's. Uh, uh, just, uh, Mr. Zakari, just how long more before we, uh, because uh, before we have uh, Pastor Praveen back? For these Bible studies, uh, I, I I'm presuming that uh, probably another month or so because he has been busy with a few other things. So, yeah. right. So, um, yeah, I, uh, we'll 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 keep you informed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Bertie, could you do the honors for us and close our session with prayer? Yeah, let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for this time together. Lord, uh, we uphold you, Lord, as uh, Lord, as uh, the Holy One, as the Lord, the Just One, Lord, and everything good is in you, Lord. Thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, Lord, as we reminded that we are saved solely by faith of Jesus Christ. But uh, as we know, we receive Christ in us and we are uh, be attached to Christ as the pro as the parable of the wine and the branches uh, clearly state and uh, by being in Christ Lord we're able to bear good fruit and God is glorified and God is glory uh, and God is blessed in every way when we trust in Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit in us uh, enabling inspiring and empowering us in in uh, walking the kingdom of God ways and Lord bring glory to uh, to you father and uh, Father, we need love. We need to, uh, besides believing in the sovereignty of Jesus Christ, we need love, Lord. And we need to walk in the truth. And we know you will help us with this, Lord. You have, have begun a good work in us, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Thank you again for this time. Thank you for Ms. Zechariah who expounded the scriptures. And Lord, gave, uh, uh, made it clear that, Lord, uh, we... Uh, we are not, Lord, members of the church, but members of the body of Christ, Lord. And we meet together and to benefit from each other, Lord, as disciples of Christ. Thank you again for your faithful servants. Thank you. Bless all those attending and bless, uh, enable others also to be able to attend, Lord, these helpful and inspiring Bible studies. Thank you again for this time together and bless us all, Lord, and keep us in your favor. We pray this prayer, Father, in Jesus Christ's holy and blessed name. Amen. Amen. Amen.